Well, my latest acquisition is this Sansui uh, Model 220. Now, this is uh, circa 1968-69. Um, this is a valve uh, receiver. So basically it's got a radio, FM radio, and uh, stereo amplifier built in. Rated about 10 watts per channel RMS. Uh, valve amplifiers tended to be much lower power than transistors, and certainly in the era, this sort of era, output stages were much lower power. Speakers were much more efficient. Um, I bought this off uh, someone who uh, I do some work for. A, a friend of his was selling it, or his friend's father was selling it. It had been sitting in his loft apparently for about 35 years. Hasn't been used for a while, obviously. Um, it's in nice condition. There's a little bit of wear on the uh, silk screen around the function knob. Everything's pretty straight. There's no nasty scratches on it or anything. Um, and this evening, it's just going to be a quick look over it just to see what actually uh, what it's like uh, in, inside. Uh, just have a look. Just make sure there's nothing obviously missing. Uh, check the valves are all inserted properly. And then it'll be a case, of, before I even attempt to power it up, to go through... Um, at least the electrolytics and replace uh, the power supply capacitors, they will be uh, needing a replacement. And also needs to be checking uh, coupling capacitors between the uh, the anodes and the grids of the uh, output valves and things like that, because the caps in these are notoriously unreliable, as are most valve uh, radio and amplifier coupling caps of the era. You know, if they're waxy caps, they're going to be leaky. Um, I'm not sure which ones these are in here, but I think they might be actual uh, sensory uh, capacitors themselves, so they might, uh, they're, they're, they're known to be unreliable, known to be leaky, and we're not going to take a chance with an amplifier like this. So basically, yeah, we've got a, it's not a stereo um, FM tuner as well, which is slightly unusual. It's um, It's got the multiplex in and multiplex out, so you can add an external stereo decoder to it if you want to, um, but it's got shortwave band as a, as a, you know, as a bonus sort of thing. Uh, so, very straightforward layout, conventional, these things didn't really change at all, these receivers, the the, uh, the front panels are more or less the same, run through quickly. Uh, so you've got a noise, noise filter here, oh, let's start with the left hand side, power switch, obviously, um, speaker switch, allows you to turn the speakers on and off, um, the maximum or minimum load you can put on those is, is 8 ohms, they're not really designed, these amplifiers aren't really designed to uh, drive a 4 ohm load. They probably will if you you don't go silly with them, but the tapping on the output transformer isn't really perfectly matched for 4 ohm. Noise filter here, um, probably just a high part, high filter, nothing more than that. Um, loudness control, for those who don't know what a loudness control is, it gives a bass uh, emphasis below half volume control. If you look at the volume control on the back, there's a tapping halfway up. And basically this gives you a bass boost. It's supposed to compensate for the ears inefficiency uh, for low frequency response. And actually some amplifiers like the Marantzis of this era tended to boost the treble as well. So it's basically uh, a bass and treble boost, probably just a bass boost on this amplifier. I tend to leave that off. Okay, volume, obviously balance, bass and treble control here. Uh, and then we've got tape monitor, which allows you to actually... Uh, when you've got that, it puts a tape loop in, so you can actually hear the, uh, the the tape machine, what the tape machine is actually doing if you're recording live. A stereo mono switch. Now that's not stereo mono, as I said, for the tuner. It just basically joins the preamplifiers together. Uh, so whatever you feed in the left will come out on the right as well, and vice versa, right on the left. So it basically ties the two amplifiers together without putting them into a bridge tied low. Basically. It's not, it doesn't increase the power of the amplifier like some of the modern amplifiers where you put them into a mono mono block mode or mono mode it will actually increase the output of the amplifier it doesn't work like that all it's doing is if you're feeding a source in say on one like your auxiliary input on left hand channel only you don't want it just coming out of the left hand channel you want it in both channels so you just press mono and it will come out on both channels you've got a ferno input here uh, and that's moving magnet funny enough the moving magnet amp preamplifier is the only uh amplifier that has one has one transistor in it or obviously two transistors one tra transistor per side so the uh, the first stage of the preamplifier and the phono is actually done by a, um, a field effect transistor i think it's a field effect no it's not a field effect transistor it's a, it's a normal bjt uh, the rest of the uh, inputs are all done through valves so there's no semiconductors uh, in the IF or anything like that. There are diodes, um, germanium diodes in the uh, product detector or discriminator 
and the rectifier is actually um, I think that's I think that's a silicon rectifier as well but um basically the all of the amplification stage really is a, is a valve amplifier um, and that's the reason why I bought it because I wanted a valve amplifier or receiver so let's just turn it around and have a look around the back see what we've got okay on the back panel pretty straightforward here uh, zoom you in a little bit so you can see a little bit easier what's going on so we've got uh, aerial inputs here for AM and FM and earth connections as well which is nice there's our phono input there auxiliary that's a multiplexer out for uh, feeding into the uh, decoder auxiliary uh, two a record and playback monitors which is a standard on most amplifiers and then we've got here our loudspeaker connections and our center channel and basically what that does is that's I think that's a mono output from the if you're feeding um, or if you want to feed like something like a subwoofer believe it or not I think it's designed to run like a center it's a center channel but it would it would run a subwoofer it basically taps the two outputs of the amp of the output of the amplifier and feeds it out here so this is basically a mono output and this uh, got speaker connections here yeah and then you select your your ohm readings you want or the type of speaker load you've got so if you've got an 8 ohm speaker you go between these two terms here if you've got 16 which are obviously you don't get 16 ohm speakers now you go between the two outer taps so it's just a, it's just the secondary taps on the transformer depending on which ones you want to do um, this is a, just a probably a switched output for a turntable or something like that so when you turn the amplifier on that socket becomes live and it enables the uh, power to turn the, the record player on or, or what el whatever else you would want, like a reel-to-reel -reel machine or something. Bear in mind, CD players and all that sort of thing were, were never uh, haven't been heard of. Um, AM aerial sticks up the back there, so it's got a, a ferrite rod as well. That's nice. Um, so as you can see, lots of uh, um, ventilation, obviously because it's a valve amplifier, it's going to run very hot. Uh, and lots of grills on the top. So these amplifiers, you couldn't put anything on the top of unless you had a big clearance because these amplifiers would run far, far hotter than any transistor amplifier ever will. Um, it's got one of the old... Um, and I'm going to leave this on there, I'm not worried about that. Um, an IEC approved mains plug without the uh, shields on. Those shields are there, so when you access, if you plug the, plug the plug in, you've actually got your fingers on there, which you can do you don't stick your hand straight across the mains so that's why they put the shielded plugs on in a later era we will check whilst we're here let's just have a look at the fuse to see what it's got in it's probably got a 13 amp in most of them have uh, if it has i'm going to put a probably put a one amp in it or two amp no it's got a three amp fuse that's good that's that's fine three amps fuse you notice that the uh, the wires and the plug are uh, not not linked not uh, marked with red or, or black in the old colors or, or blue and brown it's basically because it doesn't matter. Um, ideally, um, the main switch should should switch to live, but as it's clearly not marked up here, and you can see it's obviously been uh, through some couple of decoration runs because it's uh, got paint all over the mains lead. We we'll just check the uh, leads, make sure they're tight, and they are. It's good, so uh, that's okay. That all looks fairly safe. So the next thing to do is uh, pop the cover off the uh, amplifier and have a look inside to see if everything looks okay. Okay, and there's the insides, and it uh, all looks original. It looks in there, obviously very dusty, but in good condition. Uh, so let's give a quick run through and show you what, what's what, or roughly what's what. I don't know without checking everything. Um, so it looks like we've got here the probably the front FM. Uh, that's probably the AM front end valve. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. That's the FM front end. Here's our IF strip here for the AM and the FM. Uh, we've got a magic eye over in the corner for tuning. Um, coming forward here we've got a push-pull stage for the left and the right hand channel and that's probably a phase splitter, no is that a phase splitter? It might be a phase splitter for one of the uh, push-pull stages um, so that basically inverts the phase to one of the valves so it actually becomes a push-pull rather than a push-push or a pull-pull being technical isn't it? Uh, okay, output transformers, uh, so it takes the high voltage from the, the uh, a high impedance, high output voltage from the valves and steps it down to drive it, um, a low impedance, low voltage source um, uh, load, i.e. the speakers. So they're the, they're the audio transformers. Uh, we've got to our right here, we've got the mains transformer here with the Sansui badge on it. A smoothing capacitor here that was obviously going to need replacing. 
Uh, and basically the rest of it is sort of fairly obvious. We've got the tuning wheel over here, there's a tuning strip. Uh, we've got a main selector down here and a fuse. Uh, that fuse is loose, that's always a bit of a concern to just check. It's got a fuse in it and uh, as I say we're not going to power it up but the fuse looks, yeah, it looks intact, that's fine. So basically we need to, all we need to do first is uh, go through, check all the capacitors uh, or certainly change out all the electrolytics. That electrolytic, uh, probably what I will do just to try and keep it original, if that electrolytic I can mount that underneath, I'm going to leave that can there so it looks original um, and just cut it out of circuit. I know some people will actually just strap a capacitor across the old capacitor, that's a bad mistake to do that because if these caps might have dried out but what they can also do is fail so you just want the whole thing out of the circuit and then put a new, put a new capacitor in there and if you want to leave that one there to make it look original that's fine but you know remove them from circuit or certainly remove if it's a single stage capacitor certainly cut one of the leads off um, preferably the positive lead so if anything goes short so out internally it's still not going to blow the fuse sort of thing so that's um all right, it looks okay at the top. Uh, just yeah, probably might check, pull the valves out and check them later on once we've uh, recapped it. But no reason to think that the cap, the, the valves need doing anything to them. They all look okay. They're not sort of got any discoloration in them. They've all got their good. They've got a nice bright getter in them. Do the clean, but that's that's easy enough to do. So the next thing to do is pop the bottom off and have a look underside and see what it looks like under there. Okay, it's the underside. Uh, just a word of warning, when I took the uh, cover off and tipped it on its side, it wants to fall back on its back all the time because of the weight of the transformers, it's really dodgy. So you have to be very careful. Uh, it's the main transformers at the bottom because I put it at the top, it just falls over. So you really don't want to be falling over and smashing all the valves. That would be a, that wouldn't be a good start. So we can see here these, like, these Suzuki capacitors, I think they're Suzuki. There's some other brands down here. These are... Uh, Fox Fox Electronics, never heard of them. Uh, I don't think they've been replacements. Uh, they've been put in at a later stage, I don't know. But you can see there's a number of electrolytics to change. Uh, this one, this one, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the little smaller ones down here. Now a lot of these smaller ones can probably be replaced with um, polyesters. Uh, so we've got uh, two big electrolytics here. We've got our main smoothing capacitor, that's the one that we saw on the top that I wanted to leave in position. Uh, but we could actually probably get a, um, get some uh, capacitors mounted on the underside. Uh, that that would be the ideal. We should have to see if we can do that or not. Um, so we got so across the mains capacitor here. I think that looks like a mains filter. Well, you might be that one, but there is one that goes straight across the mains. I want to get rid of that because they're time bombs waiting to go off. Um, so yeah, to start with, we need to get these these axial uh, electrolytics out. It's got a date code. That one's got a date code of 1976 on it. So that's interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, this this amplifier dates from 69. This one's 75. I wonder if it's been recapped. I can't see any. There's a Fox cap here as well. Yeah, 76. Second of 76. So. Uh, yeah, that's a, there's a good chance that this someone's been in here and recapped it. I've never heard of Fox capacitors, but uh, I don't know. I mean, they might be still okay, but they're coming out. Uh, so, yeah, okay. Uh, I th all, all these electrolytics have got to come out. Just a quick run through. You see what what else we've got in here. So this is our uh, this is our IF strip here. This is our power amplifier section here. This is the phono amplifier board here. A little cap there for filtering probably. It looks like it's about to fall out. I think it's alright. Uh, there's the two transistors there that are uh, the, the, the input for the uh, phono amplifier. And obviously we've got some uh, coils and things here. I'm not sure what they are. The selector switches, volume controls, tone controls, etc. are all here. Um, so we need, I think I want to do is I'm going to start from the uh, the bottom, work my way up. Uh, so I'll probably lie it down on its uh, back, and make sure that uh, none of the valves are close to touching the ground, if, uh, touching the bench. If they are, I'll just take the valves out. Two adjustments here look like for a quiescent current for the valves, setting up the the, uh, the bias for the valves. I also saw these resistors here. I've got like a, 
an adjustment. You see these wire round resistors, they've got a, like, a, like a rheostat adjustment where you can adjust the position of the uh, slider. I'll have to look in the circuit diagram and see what that is. Can't find a service manual for it. Um, there's another some more other adjustments there as well. They might be for each valve, I'm not sure, but we need to look through all that. Can't find a service manual for it. I've got a schematic, uh, but unfortunately that's all I've got. Uh, so I've taken some photographs inside just to make sure everything's okay. There's the, there's the silicon rectifiers there, I think they're silicon. Some silicon diodes. Okay, so I think basically I need to make a shocking list up of what caps I need, see what I've got in my uh, inventory, and uh, move on from there. I just thought I'd show you this before I start sort of changing caps and measuring caps and sort of changing stuff out. This is a bit, as Dave Jones would say, how are you doing? Look at the way that resistor sort of like in the air and that diodes and in series of that is that resistor. I mean, that is that original? I mean, they look like they're, they're, they're looks like the ratio, that's the ratio detector and they're the two diodes. But the way those resistors are mounted are pretty bloody awful, I must admit. To untidy that up a bit. I don't think that's. I think it looks original. I don't know. If it, is it original? I mean, it's very low voltage on that, but it just looks looks awful. Looks very badly done. Very unprofessional. There's the other. There's the other diode. So uh, yeah, there's some uh, slightly suspect wiring in here. I mean, most of it. I mean, this this tag strip stuff is tends to be a little bit like that anyway. But uh, look around some of the rest of it. It's uh, it's all a bit. Untidy. It's not. It's not the nicest uh, underside of a valve radio I've ever seen. But uh, I suppose it's not the worst either. Yeah, these are the sort of caps I was showing you. Uh, what's this one? This is, is a Suzuki. No, it's the same company that make the motorbikes, but uh, I doubt it. It's probably going to be fine. That one change. Ceramic cap caps down here. Fine. Uh, I think that's the cross the mains one I was looking at, but also there's one down here that needs replacing. So yeah, let's make a move, make a start on this, and uh, get these caps out. Right, it's two days later from the last clip, uh, and I've been going through changing um, capacitors that uh, I have, and I've, I've managed to get a few <coughs> from uh, other sources. So basically I've replaced all the capacitors that are uh, either failing or uh, have high voltage on them. There are, you can see a number of these capacitors are still remain and these are just basically filter capacitors, they've just got AC across them so they've got, they've got no DC across them and they're not, not at risk of damaging the amplifier. So I've replaced a lot of these uh, caps here and they've all these caps have actually got Fox Electronics on them uh, and these Fox Electronics capacitors are sort of dated 1975 I think I pointed that out in the last clip. So I've been through I've stripped out all the decouplers. These are the uh, decoupling caps for the uh, the output stage. These are really leaky, and I think that's probably why the uh, uh, thing was probably put away anyway, because I've got a feeling that the, the, the whole sound quality of the thing was probably deteriorating. So I think it's really to sort of power it on and, and try it just to see if everything looks okay. The main filtering capacitor is here, um, and I haven't changed it out yet. It's a I think it's a four, yes, a four section 22 microfarad capacitor. Um, and I want to see, I did check it with my high voltage power supply and wound it up to sort of its maximum working voltage and it wasn't leaky and it um, wasn't drawing any current, which is good. Uh, so I left it them to all reform and discharge them again. And I put them on the capacitor test and they took that capacitor test excellent. It tests like it's really very strong. Uh, there's no bulging in it or anything. For the, so for the time being, it's a bit of a cheapskate, I know, but I, w I would like to keep that capacitor in there if that capacitor is okay. Simply because, because it's a four-stage capacitor, it's going to be a pain in the ass to get a capacitor in there that will mount up nicely. So, um, yeah, as I say, basically I've replaced all the capacitors that are, are suspect. Uh, replaced most of the electrolytics. This electrolytic, two here, one, two here, um, this one. Uh, and these are polyesters uh, for, for audio decoupling and uh, high tension. So these run off the uh, anode of the, the previous valve and feed to the grid. So if those caps are leaky, you're going to red plate, as the Americans call it, red plate or over dissipate the, uh, the valve. The valve's going to be conducting hard on all the time. Um, so I think the first thing to do is uh, let's power this up with a dim bulb. 
power it up gently just to see what happens, make sure there's nothing horrible happening. Now I'm not going to connect any speaker up or anything, I'm just going to power it up uh, with a dim bulb and uh, see see what it does, make sure it doesn't do anything horrible. I've also, as you can see inside, it's a bit of hand holding. Or hand holding, hand holding? Peel the, the top end up, and it's all nice and shiny how it should be now. You can see all the dust has gone, blown all the dust out, cleaned it all down. It's in it's in nice condition actually, nice condition. So, uh, this thing. So, the step to do now is to power it up, uh, just to see what happens, I suppose. So let's do that now, I suppose. Um, we connected the dim bulb, uh, all ready to go. Switch it on. Okay, the bulb's pretty bright at the moment. So let's just see what happens. Let's try and get it into a position where you can see it best. Okay. You can see the bulb's getting very dim, much dimmer. Uh, that's how it should be. What I'm trying to say is it's, it's dimming down nicely, which means that uh, it's, the valves are warming up. And they should start to get bright again as the valve starts to conduct. Okay. Nothing horrible. Happening. Now, if there was a problem here, this suddenly would go suddenly very bright, which it, which it's not doing. That's good. And I could just about make out now here. It's very very dim, but I could just about make out uh, the magic eye. You probably can't see that because it really is very dim. So, uh, all right, let's go for full mains and see what happens. So we're on full mains now, and that magic eye is really dim. So I'm just I'm assuming our HT is okay, um, and you can see in the background there the valves warming up. So that's that's all looking okay. So I think the next thing to do now is let's get the um, let's get some audio connected to it and see see if it works properly. See if it's got any sort of any distortion and the, actually the sound works. But initial power on test looks like it's uh, everything looks fine and there's no problem with it. So let's connect some audio up and try it. Right, let's try this. Uh, connected to auxiliary one. Uh, it's taking, uh, playing some computer music fed into the uh, amplifier because I don't want any copyright. Uh, so let's power this up, see what happens. Just wait for it to warm up. Obviously because it's a valve set, it will take a while to warm. Do we get any sound? And indeed we do. Brilliant. And even the pots are pretty quiet, mind you. I must admit, I did go through and clean the pots whilst I had the whole thing apart last, last night, so... I think the bass seems a bit heavy on it. I must admit the magic eye is also very dim, but it's certainly working okay. See that, how dim that magic eye is. It may have one of those, um, so maybe it's worth having a look for see if we can find another magic eye. But it's certainly working. It sounds fine. I mean, it is bass heavy. I need to look at the uh, tone control circuit, make sure that's all okay. Could you can't play any other music really. Let's have a look. See what else we got. Okay, so the input's working fine. Let's try it on the radio. So let's try it on FM. Is that FM or is that AM? It's that's FM there. Improvements across the railway. The magic eye is pretty sharp though, actually. That needs replacing. See that very clearly. Very pleased that actually works very well. Seems to be working, you know, almost like new to be honest. With you. There's no hum, um, no problem at all. The only thing is that magic eye. 
So let's see if I can find a, another magic eye in my stash of valves. I've got a funny feeling I bought one for a, a radio a couple of years ago and that actually never fitted it. So let's go have a look. See if I'm going to have a, find another valve for that. Okay, I have found another valve. Um, and it tests strong. I've written strong on it. So let's plug that in and see if that improves it. Uh, so I've swapped the other valve out. I've taken the clamp off the, off the valve and we'll just uh, take it apart so we can... Uh, Get a bit more mission. So that's the old one. Six E five, the same. Can't see a manufacturer's note on it, but there is a a broad arrow marked on the on the bottom of the valve. So I don't know if this valve's been replaced at some other point, but can you see this broad arrow between the two pins? So it's obviously uh, an issued uh, valve. So let's try this other valve. Okay, so let's have another go, see what we get next. So, switch it on. See if this one's any brighter. Now, if it's still dim, it would be, you know, a lack of HT, but I don't think there is a lack of it. Oh, look at that. <laughs> wow. That's a little bit better, isn't it? So there we go. Uh, I need to just orientate the valve so the, the uh, slot's in the right place. But if you see now a tune... bit difficult for you to see because the exposure of the camera is blowing it out but that's a really bright tube now and you can I think you can see the shadow marking so it's uh, working nicely okay so at this point I think I'm going to put the bottom back on and then I will leave it on the bench to soak for a couple of hours see how it performs Right, although this, the radio seems to be working very well, the receiver seems to be working very well, I'd just like, like to check um, the output valves. The simple reason, the magic eye was very dim, and that would suggest that this thing's probably done a lot of work. Um, not necessarily, it could be just a, a bad valve, uh, but I would like to check. So these are 6BM8s, and these are the output pentodes. So we're going to just check both the section of the pentode. Uh, so starting off with the first section, I've set it up so it's... We should be at position 2 for this switch, uh, 8 for the heaters, a C test point here, yes, so C should be on 4, which is BM68. Uh, then D is 14, which is a variable pot, which is just a sensitivity adjustment. Cathode shorts are checked on 8, uh, and then test on one and, 1 and 9. So switch the valve tester on, bring it up to the line level. For those who are interested in this valve tester, this is a comma um, kit built valve tester I bought on eBay. Uh, American. It's got a, I put a fitted an auto transformer in there so I could use it on 240 volt mains, otherwise, you, it means you have to sort of run it with a um, an isolation transformer or a step down transformer. Okay, so the thing should have warmed up now. So we're just checking our uh, positions here again 6BM8, so it's 2 8. 4, that goes to 4, D is 14, which you've checked, cathode shorts are tested on, on 8, so we get a test, that looks good, and then we go to test on 1 and 9, so this goes to 1, this one goes to 9, press this button here, and we see we're getting about, on this meter, about 75%, and climbing so this this is quite good this meet uh, this um tester it doesn't it's not over optimistic it's not under optimi optimistic but uh you see it's climbing now to about yeah 75 percent. it's well in the good just check our line levels a little bit low just bring that up a bit we might be getting a bit of parallax on the on the uh on the meter yeah we're, we're climbing to 75 76 percent so that valve's good um so what we'll do is we'll disconnect that one and we'll plug in the next one. Let's see what that one tests like. Obviously, because it's a push-pull stage, we need to make sure that uh, both the valves are pulling and pushing at the same amount, otherwise you get higher distortion. So, Okay, up to the line level. Just being propped up so it's easier for you to see. 
because I can't find the top of my tripod at the moment. So the tripod shoe's missing, so the camera just bounced on the top of the tripod. Okay, let's see what we've got here. Yeah, and similar, sort of 75, 76%. And we could check our cathode shorts again, which were on, uh, what were they? Cathode shorts were on four, weren't they? Where are we? My cathode shorts were on eight, so go turn that to eight. Yeah, just a brief flash, which is, no, it's gone now, so it's just charged to go back. So the output valves are good. Uh, so no problem with there. With, with the output valves. I think I might check a few of the other valves um, and then uh, put it back together and uh, finish the thing off really. Almost forgot to test the second stage. So this is the second part of the uh, valve. There's a two-stage valve. Um, and we're just checking the measurement here. And here it comes. It's just coming up. Yeah, and that's good as well. So clearly I'll go through all the valves but I assume and I expect should I uh, that all the valves uh, should be the same because they've all been in the same circuit and they've all looked like the original valves but that's, that's testing good that one 85 percent so yep looks like the valves are good um, no problem there so that's reassuring I don't know why the magic car is so weak maybe it was just a poor poor quality valve um, but uh, the rest of the valves here look like NEC valves, so I'll go through those, check those. If I find anything unusual, I'm, I'll show you on the video, but otherwise we'll uh, just continue on to the final stage of putting it back together and having a listen. Well, one thing that was blatantly obvious when I was using this amplifier or receiver was that the tone uh, response wasn't correct. In the flat response, there was a large bass boost and a bit of a, possibly a bit of a treble roll-off as well. So I went through and checked all the components in the tone control circuit. Everything looks okay. I mean, it's a sort of indicative of like a, maybe a loudness control switched on. I went through that. Loudness control is definitely switched out of the circuit. Um, so I'm just going to do a frequency response test. Now the amplifier is being fed in with its auxiliary input from the HP8903. We're using good old Peak Minute software, which I'm really grateful for because I use this a lot. Uh, so we're going to feed in a swept signal from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and we look at the frequency response with the tone controls, as I say, in the centre position. So let's try that. Uh, so we should be set up. It's just going to feed a signal in. Okay. I think we're probably overdriving the amplifier a little bit, but we'll try it just to see what happens. Okay. Start. Okay. It's doing a frequency sweep now. Got a funny feeling I'm overdriving the amplifier. Okay, let's have a look. Okay, you'd expect a plus or minus two or three dB on an amplifier of this age. Anything worse? That's we've got a low frequency roll off here on the low on the left hand side as you can see. That's standard for a, a, a transformer coupled amplifier uh, with um, fairly small transformers in it. So here we go. I ex so you can see actually a bit of a bass boost, but it's not huge, I must admit. So that's pretty good actually. I'm quite pleased with that. That's not a bad response. So I'm wondering why it's got sounds like it's got so much bass boost in it. So let's just zoom into that section so we've got a better uh, resolution on the scale. So there we go. So our zero dB reference point here. We have got a hump of about one dB, but it sounds much much more severe than that when I listen to it through the uh, through the speakers. So um, I'm just going to experiment with a couple of resistors just to see if I can actually flatten that slight bass boost off it that that looks fine you know if I saw that on a, on a response of an amplifier I'd say that's fine what I will actually do I think I'm going to run this through again with a lower level so let me just, let's run this through at a lower level so I'm going to quit the program I'm wondering if the amplifier is actually clipped at this point and it's run out of headroom so it's just held the level down so let's quit this program restart it I'm going to put in a different level because uh, I think I might have run into clipping there so start 20 hertz, end 20 kilohertz. 
and we're going to have steps of 10 and rather than 0 point uh, 1000 millivolts or 1 volt I'm going to go to 0 0.6 which is what I tend to use so let's try this again a start and you should say let's check our reference points are at 6 volts 6, 6, 6, 36 divided by 8 yeah that should be okay so you should be well below our 10 watts threshold okay let's have another look because I'm sure the base response boost I, I hear is much worse than it's showing on the way on the scale. Okay, it's gone off the top of the scale. That's right. It will it will pull back in in a moment. Let's wait for it to finish. Now, ideally, if I can, can I want to be able to adjust these tone controls. So when it actually says it's flat, it is actually flat. I don't want a, a big. Well, you can see we've got a good 3 dB boost there. So yeah, the previous run was clipped. And it should hopefully flatten out fairly well here. Look at the response on the audio analyzer at the moment, and it's pretty flat now, actually. Looks like rise again. So let's have a look, see what we've got in the way of the response curve now. Zoom in. Yeah, so there you go. You've got 4 dB. That's what. I, that's more like it sounds to me. At least at least 4 dB. So we've so got a 4 dB boost at 100, and 100 hertz, and it flattens down and becomes fairly flat after about 1 kilohertz. So some of the tone controls aren't working how I would imagine they should. I'm going to run it through again. But this time I'm going to run the tone controls at minimum minimum base. I'm not touching any other control. I'm just going to run it through. So trace two will be with the uh, base control at minimum and everything else unchanged. So we're going to start again. And you should see a blue trace following. It should you should see it rapidly come up from underneath there it is okay all right so we've actually overcompensated this time okay so you see the effect that the base controls had basically after this one kilohertz point it should track the yellow trace Let's see if it does or not yeah it looks like it's tracking the yellow trace so I'll do one more test with the base control turned slightly down and then we'll see what that does. So yeah, that's clearly too much of a base cut. So you can see that our 0 dB reference point, which is what we want, we need basically want a line that tracks all the way along. If it, For perfect response, if the line uh, tracks along the 0 dB mark, that would be perfect. Okay, so we're uh, not enough base control now. So I'll put the base control to the... I'm putting it to the 10 o'clock position, and our next trace, tra trace 3, will be in that position. As I get, like, like last time, nothing else has been adjusted. There we go. There's our red, you see our pink trace has come up already. And we've all, already still got a bit of a base boost on. That's interesting, because it's, it's, it's still there, but it's a, it's a shallower curve, it's a tighter curve. So there's something a bit odd with these tone controls, I must admit. They seem to be very... Um, it could be that the uh, the carbon pot in the uh, tone control, or in the actual control itself, is sort of like on high resistance, you know, maybe with wear and tear. Okay, so it's better, but it's still got that big, big hump at uh, 100 hertz, which is sounds really quite boomy. Um, and that's one thing a valve amplifier with this low power sort of level doesn't need, doesn't need to be wasting energy in sort of, well it's not infrasonic but the very low base because it's just that's using all the power from the amplifier. So yeah that's okay, still got too much of a base boost so I'm going to right, adjust it slightly differently, I'm going to adjust it to the, uh, adjust it to the, about the 8 o'clock position, eight eight thirty on the control, just to see the last trace we can put on here. Which is trace 
for just see if we can actually pull it in with the tone controls it should be coming up now there it is okay it should level hopefully level off very quickly see so it has got that hump there that's difficult to get rid of okay So basically all we've done is reduce the hump and we've uh, yeah made it made it sharper but obviously it's uh, it, it is it is much flatter than it was before but still not still not good uh, plus, that's a plus, plus two and a half DB yes, I suppose that's acceptable but yeah it needs to come down a bit more so what I'm going to do I'm going to pause the video uh, and I'm going to try and adjust some of the components in the uh, in the amplifier and uh, I'll let you know what I've done and we'll see if we can make any improvement on that. Okay, what I've done is I've altered the input impedance into the input of the tone control amplifier. I did it with a decade box off, off video and it seems to have made a difference to the response of the bass control. Now, so we're going to run it through again. Uh, there's a 100 kilo ohm resistor that feeds the input to the tone controls and the, uh, the base, the, well, well, the whole input actually from the preamplifier. Um, so I've put a, another resistor in parallel, which is a, what's that, a 50, 51K? Yeah, 5 green-brown, 51K resistor in parallel with this 100K. And it seems to have brought the, the, the tone controls roughly into sort of where I'd expect them to be. Um, this is by ear, of course. You know, I've to compare it with the transistor amplifier, and it sounded sort of flatter. So I'm going to run it through again, uh, exactly the same turn. Nothing else has been touched. I put the base controls at flat, so this is a similar to the first. Well, it should be the same as the first sweep we did before. I'm going to start the sweep again, and hopefully we won't get such a sort of marked base boost. So let's go start. Uh, chip references okay. Are we got uh, the mini bolts? Got a lot more drive level actually. I've noticed that. Let's try it. Start. Okay. Which I suppose we would have if we altered the series component. Right, I want to peg that in pretty quickly. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. That's much better. Look at that. You see, it hasn't because before it's gone. It shot straight off the line. But now. We've got a pretty good flat response. That I'm very pleased with that. Let's see what the top end. See if it's affected the top end. That's weird. Then, so wonder what's changed here because, well, you know, as I said before, the passive components test okay, but the frequency response was pretty bad. Let's run it through. See what happens. So we've still got a very slight bass boost, but it's not bad. It's you know. So it looks like 1 dB. We'll zoom it in in a minute and have a look. Okay, and a bit of a roll off at 10 kilohertz. As I say, nothing else has been touched. So, yeah, okay. So let's zoom that in and have a closer look. There we go. So we're pretty flat from sort of like, well, plus 1 dB at, um, well, plus 1 dB. I mean, that's that's flat. In my in my book, that's flat. I will just turn the bass down very slightly, and we'll do another sweep, but I, I'm going to leave it like this. This is That's brilliant. I'm very pleased with that result. I'm turning the bass down to 11 o'clock. I'm going to run it through again. So trace 2. Here we go again. Let's see what that does. Very subtle change, isn't it? Now I think it probably with this series resistance, the series resistance um, I've adjusted the input impedance to the amplifier has been changed. I think that's going to make the bass control probably less responsive. But yeah, very slightly reduce the bass. That's fine. Happy with that. I will do one more run. We'll do it at uh, nine o'clock position. See if we can flatten it out anymore, but I'm happy with that. As I say, that's going back together. 
and uh, it's just strange. I'll, I would love to know why it's, it's different, but I can't see anything wrong with any of the components. So. Okay, let's run it through again. Is it completed? It's about to complete. Yeah, it's completed. Okay. Okay, so the final trace we're going to do on this is the base controls now at 9 o'clock. Let's have a look and see what that does. Okay, you see what it's done now, it's obviously got a much steeper roll off and that's actually a worse performance curve, so that's good. Yep, happy with that. So we'll let, we'll, we will let it finish and then I'll do what I'll do is I'll do a quick total to harmonic distortion check just to make sure it's uh, within reason. Um, these are never going to be as good as a transistor amplifier, you're not going to be 0.0. .0 2% or anything like I, I would expect to see in something in the range of maybe 1%, possibly a bit higher, but uh, that should be fine. So let's let this finish and we'll do a frequency, uh, a, a distortion uh, check. Yeah, there we go. All right, so let's move on to the distortion check. Okay, that's the distortion figure, which is actually higher than I was expecting. Uh, so that's at one kilohertz, uh, moderately driven, uh, two percent, which is uh, yeah, that's on the borderline of being sort of like unacceptable. I must admit, I can't hear any distortion. Uh, it could be just down to the response of the amplifier. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to fret about anything like that. It certainly sounds nice. You also got to remember that these valves had. Um, a third harmonic distortion to them anyway, these triode valves anyway, and then maybe that's what I'm seeing here. But uh, the audio analyzer's clearly picked that up, you know, and it's uh, showing it as 2%. So let's uh, get the covers back on it and uh, we'll uh, go from there. Well, let's finish up with this sensory amplifier receiver. Um, come up really nicely, it was in good condition originally. Um, yeah, all right, caps needed replacing definitely because it was the, the initial sound was would have been very distorted. There was a lot of leakage on the caps. That's why you should never power these valve amplifiers up with the original capacitors unless you're absolutely sure they're okay. Magic Eye was weak, replaced that. Um, but So basically, recap. I haven't touched the alignment. I don't think I can improve on the alignment. The alignment's spot on, even on shortwave. The, the frequency um, seems to be um, perfectly aligned, so I'm, I'm not going to adjust anything on that respect. I'm not going to just adjust it because the just for the sake of it sort of thing. Tone control response was poor, yeah, we've adjusted that with the uh, resistors, so now with the, in the flat response, it's as pretty flat as it's gonna be, plus two dB boost at 100 hertz, and flat after that, so I'm very pleased with that, uh, over the sort of plus four and a half dB it had before. So have a quick scan through, and then we'll uh, we'll shut it down. Let's go to Iran for the release of Nazanin. A special edition of Short Works, our adventures in sound about music and music. And played the prospect of British Iranian Nazanin's well, titles of the movements of Handel. Compounds for the clarity cure leukemia. You can see that's pretty sensitive, that's an external aerial. Let's just try it on short wave, see if we've got anything this evening. <laughs> Fortunately it's not very selective, so you're very touchy on the controls. Shortwave set seems, seems pretty sensitive. 
there's some single sideband uh, amateur stuff. We could try and resolve that quickly, I suppose. Let's just see, what's, what's that, 7 meg? I'm going to just put in a beat frequency oscillator from the signal generator so we can hear anything. Okay, so that's an amateur radio signal. Um, normally this radio wouldn't be able to pick this up. I'm just using a signal generator to um, match the same incoming frequency, slightly offset, and that acts as a beat frequency oscillator. So you can hear it's a, a pretty sensitive little radio. Shannon Volmet, like again, as you can see here, single sideband signal. And let's try it on medium wave, and that will be it. And this is working on its internal ferrite rod aerial. So, as you can see, it's extremely sensitive on all the bands. It's actually a very good performer. Um, so, I'm very pleased with that. Um, just need to find somewhere where I can actually use it every day. And now I'm going to be in the hunt for some valve uh, amplifiers. So, if anyone's got any valve amplifiers they want to sell me at non eBay prices, please let me know. So, we'll listen to, listen out on the uh, Sensory 220 and we'll shut it down in the traditional valve way. Thanks for watching.